to welcome you to Bible study. Welcome to the house of the Lord. Welcome to the presence of the Lord. In his presence, there is fullness of joy. And at his right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. And so tonight, what has been laid on my heart to speak to us tonight on is prepare for your blessing. Prepare for your blessing. And we'll read 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 1 through to 7. 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 1 to 7. Or verse 1 to 7. Now there cried a, wo a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets unto Elisha, saying, Thy servant, my husband, is dead, and thou knowest that thy servant did fear the Lord, and the creditor is come to take unto him my two sons to be bondmen. And Elisha said unto her, What shall I do for thee? Tell me. What hast thou in the house? And she said, Thine handmaid hath not anything in the house, save a pot of oil. Then he said, Go borrow thee vessels abroad of all thy neighbors, even empty vessels, borrow not a few. And when thou art come in, thou shalt shut the door upon thee and upon thy sons, and shalt pour out into all those vessels, and thou shalt set aside that which is full. So she went from him, and shut the door upon her, and upon her sons, who brought the vessels to her. And she poured out. And it came to pass, when the vessels were full, that she said unto her son, Bring me yet a vessel. And he said unto her, There is not a vessel more, and the oil stayed. Then she came and told the man of God, and he said, Go sell the oil, and pay thy debt, and live thou and thy children of the rest. This is the word of the Lord. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 30 tells us, Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly, abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us, unto him be glory. And in Acts chapter 1 verse 8, it tells us that after that, the Holy Ghost is come upon you. You shall have power. Or you shall have power after the Holy Ghost is come upon you. And so when the Holy Spirit empowers us, when we allow Christ to dwell in us, when we allow his love to master us, when we allow him to fill us with his fullness, then he is able to do abundantly, exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. But we have to allow him to do what he will in us. All right? Until those conditions are met, that is, we allow him to empower us, to dwell in us, to love us, and also to live out his fullness in us then his work is limited. But when it is met, his work is unlimited. So if we allow him then to work in us, all right, do according to his will and his purpose, then he's, he's, he is unlimited when it comes to us, all right? And if we turn to St. John chapter 14, verses 12 to 14, it says, I'll read while you find it, Truly, truly, I say unto you, he who believes in me, 
The works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go to, my, to the Father. And whatever you ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Somebody say, prepare for your blessing. Yes. What a privilege that we have. He says, ask anything in my name. And without a doubt, if we ask anything in his name, he said he's going to do it. It therefore means if we're going to ask anything of him and he'll do it, it means we're going to ask according to his will and his purpose. To know his will and his purpose is to have a relationship with him. To know who your God is. So when you know who he is and what his will is for you, you will ask according to his will. And if you ask according to his will, he's saying to us, he will do it. And I say it's a privilege for us. It's like putting it in our, our era. Or, or, or in, 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 in this example then, you have a rich uncle or a rich cousin or a rich father or a mother. And they say to you, ask of me anything and I will give it to you. Would we sit around with our mouth closed? Or we just ask of what we want? We ask, don't it? And that's the privilege that he's giving to us. He's saying to us, we should ask anything and he's going to do it. But we walk around like beggars, walk around looking popped down and brought down, all because we don't ask. He knows what we want, you know. He knows what we want. He says that if our earthly father knows just what to give us, what about our heavenly father? He knows us inside out. He knows the end from the beginning. But he says there's a principle. And the principle is asking. Even in our household, we have that. We don't ask that our children walk about and just take anything that they want. We teach them the principle from they are young, from they are babies, that they ask for what they want. And that's the principle that the Lord has laid out for us. He said, anything that you ask, but you're going to ask according to his will and his purpose. If our children ask us for things that we know will hurt them, will we give it to them? But they know us. And even when they come to us for things that they know they're not supposed to get, you can see the look on their face. They are shy. They are timid to come to ask. And it's the same thing because they know you that much. They know just what to ask of you. Because they know mommy going to give me. Daddy going to give me. Or auntie's going to give me because I know auntie. And I know auntie's capacity. Don't it? So it's the same thing he's saying to us. Same principle. If you know me, you can ask of me anything and you're going to receive it because you know me. All right? So verse 1 tells us, Now there cried a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets unto Elisha, saying, Thy servant, my husband, is dead. And thou knowest that thy servant did fear the Lord. And the creditor is come to take unto him my two sons as bondmen. And so as we have just heard, this was a widow. He was a, she was the wife of one of the sons of the prophets. And she was in debt, right? And she had no means at all to pay it. Now the legal system in Israel at the time did not allow for anyone to declare bankruptcy, all right? <laughs> so she had to give her sons as servants to the creditor to pay for payment of the debts. And it might sound um, cold and heartless, but the man was within his rights, all right? And so under the Mosaic law, we can read it in, in the book of Leviticus chapter 25 and 27, where... Under Hebrew law, you're, you're allowed to enslave a debtor, right? And his children 
in order to recover the debt that you would have had. But you can keep the person as far as the year of Jubilee. And the year of Jubilee is the 15th year. All right, 15 years. Um, during that time, when the 15th year, year comes, it allows for you to emancipate the, 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 the slave. And also, it goes as far as to even rest the land. All right? So this woman, this widow, who is indebted to this person, would have to allow her sons to be enslaved for at least 15 years. This is what she's looking at. And so the, wid the widow sought help from the only place that she associates with holiness, and that is from God through his manservant. And so the question to us tonight is, does the people who are around us, do they associate holiness with us? Whether it is in our workplace, in our schools, in the classroom, in our community, even in our homes, in our family, do they associate holiness with us? So the, the, the woman was seeking God's help, but through his manservant. Is it that in your working environment, in your school environment, in your community, does the people who live around you, who work around you, who operate around you, look to you as the one who has a connection with God. So if something goes wrong in the, in, the, in the classroom, something goes wrong in the school, it should be a child of God, you and I, who should they should be running to first. To say, okay, no, Sister Marian, I'm in the office. You can ask her to pray, you know. You can ask her to intervene. You can ask Elder to intervene. You can ask Sister to intervene. Are they looking to us? And we know that there is a great deal of suffering in this world. There is. But there is hope for those who trust in God. She had her issues. She was in deep trouble. But she sought help from God. Somebody said, prepare for your blessing. And many persons suffer innocently. And there are those who we think are suffering innocently but they really are not so very innocent. But in this passage of scripture, it appears to be the case of a really innocent person because the widow comes to tell Elisha her tale of her want and her woe. Her husband has been one of the sons of the prophets, as the scripture tells us, and unfortunately, he fell into, into death. How he was led into death, it did not tell us. We don't know how it was. But because we know that he's a God-fearing man, we can presume or assume that it wasn't, it wasn't done because of indulgence in sin. So he never goes in our day, go and buy a lot with it, or go gamble, or go buy something, womanize with it, why he was in death. It could be, yes, his own indiscretion could have thrown him into debt. It could be his own carelessness. It could be that he invested the money and the investment, you know, fell apart. Something went wrong. It could be that he lent out the money too to help somebody else. And the persons did not repay him before he died. But you know, persons do that. After the person is dead, they say, boy, the person dead, you know, so the money dead with them. So don't care if the person have a family, if they have children. It doesn't matter that I know me, I know you, me, oh, are your husband or your wife, which is really not fair. So this is what happened to this lady. But any, no matter how it was that he got into death, his wife is now facing the blunt of what has happened. And there's a lot I could say tonight on the danger of getting into debt and the innocent ones who suffer. But that is not what the Lord wants us to hear tonight. Or this afternoon or this morning, based on when those of us who are online are viewing, this is not what the Lord wants us to hear. He wants to bless you. 
He wants to bless me. His desire is to bless us, and so he wants us to prepare to receive it. Somebody said, prepare to receive your blessing. All right. So the creditor in this story was like a really Shylock. He wanted his pound of flesh, and he would be satisfied with nothing less. Because if you look at the flip side of it, the man on the other hand seemed very heartless. He knew by coming to the, this widow's house that she's unable to pay. He also, know, he also knew that there was no goods to confiscate from the lady to cover the debt. And even if there were, it probably would be of no value. If he had any slightest amount of, as I would say, you know, compassion, he would think that, okay, the lady, the widow have two sons. So I'm going to take one of them. I'm going to leave one of them with her to console her and to work enough to sustain them. But no, he wanted both sons. And he, he, yes, Sister Gail, very wicked. Very wicked. And he, he seemed to have no remorse about it, no pity, no mercy. He seemed selfish. He wanted these two sons, and he would have known... He would have known the law as well that he could not release or he would not release any of these sons until after 15 years. The scripture did not say how old the widow was. So we don't even know that after 15 years she will still be alive to even see her sons again. What he was determined. And so the man of God asked the widow. He saw the situation that he was, she was in. He was moved with compassion. And he said, he asked the widow, what shall I do for thee? Tell me what hast thou in the house. And I believe even if she had nothing in the house, God would still operate in her situation. He can make anything out of nothing. He can make something out of nothing. And I believe that he often used something in our lives to bring out the miracle or to bring out or to bring to run miracle in our lives, not because he has to do it, not for his sake, but for our sake. Because can you imagine you ask the Lord for a house or you ask him for a car? And the car just appear out of nowhere. Or the house just appear out of nowhere. What would you do? You ask the Lord for a child. You ask the Lord for a Bible. And you use the Bible. And all of a sudden the Bible appear in your hand. What would you do? How would you feel? What would you be thinking? God is a magician, not you. Something to write about this God, don't it? And so I believe, this is my belief, that the Lord will use objects and will use things in our lives to bring about what it is that we ask for, not for his sake, but for our sake. Because we are filled with doubt. We are filled with fear. This is what bombards us as humans. And if you remember, when I was putting this together, it came to my mind, that's when I reached this section. I remember when Bishop Evans gave the the testimony, those of us who are here long enough will remember when they were on their way from a, a meeting and bread was scarce. And they were asking the Lord for bread. Now, if it is, well, I'll give his account first. His account was that a bread a van passed, right? And then they would have found bread. Bread fell out and they found and they got bread. And they got enough loaves for the number of persons who were in the vehicle. Now... If they had asked for the loaves of bread, and out of nowhere, no vehicle, no pass, and the bread just drop in the van or drop in front of them, what do you think would happen? You don't think they were, even though they were, they were praying for it and hoping for it, it just dropped from the sky. It just appeared out of nowhere. Probably they wouldn't even want to eat the bread, don't you think? 
So our God is wise. So he allowed the van to pass. And then the bread came. And they got the bread. It also reminded me of Moses. The Lord used the rod that was in his hand. He asked him what he has in his hand. And he used it. When the Lord um, did his first miracle in Canaan, he turned water into wine. He didn't pull it out of nowhere. All right? He turned water into wine. But even out of nothing, God can make something. And so he asked her what he, she had in the house. And she said, Thine handmaid hath not anything in the house save a pot of oil. Then he said, Go borrow thee vessels abroad of all thy neighbors, even empty vessels. Borrow not a few. Somebody say, prepare for your blessing, no man. Yes, man. He said, go and borrow from your neighbors. And don't borrow no little bit. Whole heap, Sister Annie. One whole heap. As much as you can borrow, you borrow it. And it, 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 it is said that the jar of oil that the widow spoke of was not a large supply. Like you would have a five-gallon oil, bottle of oil or so on. It wasn't that big bottle of oil. It was just a small bottle of Vessel of oil that is used for maybe anointing. A flask of oil used to anoint the body. So it wasn't anything big and grand that she had in the house. And so Elisha told her to go and borrow vessels everywhere from all of our neighbors. And so whatever it is that we desire from God, what it is that you have in your hand, what you have in your possession to work with, whether it's a piece of land, it's a house, some money, a car, a job. What it is that you have that God can work with to work miracle in your life. The Lord might tell some of us to go by a key ring. First, when I was looking at this, I was thinking of a car key ring. But I said, no, it doesn't have to be a car key ring. A key ring is a key ring. It can be a house that's going to be attached to the key ring, a key, a, house for a, a, a key for a house. It doesn't have to be a car. So he tells us to go buy a key ring, but we think it's stupid. We can't drive. We have never driven before. We are scared of the road, so why God ask me? I don't have a piece of land. People in my, com in my family forsake me. They don't give me anything, so where am I, am I going to build a house? What am I doing with a key ring? Some of us, he tells us, Go buy a car seat, a baby car seat. You don't have any children. When me I buy a car seat, for, I've been trying for years and for years and for years and nothing. But the Lord tell you to go buy a car seat. But you don't believe because you don't see it coming. But whatever it is that the Lord tells you to do, go and do it. Elisha made this woman commit herself in faith to God's provision. To borrow vessels in this manner invited questions. But she did as the word of the Lord through his prophets commanded her. Because why in God's name would I be borrowing vessels from my neighbor? Empty vessels. Any amount that I can get, I should borrow it. But she did it in faith. God takes care to deliver his servants in ways that exercise their faith. He would not have them to be a little in faith, for faith is the wealth of the heavenly life. And if we remember what Bishop Fisher, Pastor Fisher said to us during convocation, and of us remember what the currency of heaven is? Let me see who was in convocation. <laughs> and you don't remember what Bishop Fisher, Pastor Fisher told us that the, that the currency of heaven was? Faith, man. Yes, man, faith. The currency of heaven is faith. To get there, it takes faith. To pull anything from the bank account of heaven, we have to use faith. And so faith is the wealth of the heavenly life. And so God is still speaking to us. So the only thing that stands between you and your blessing 
the thing that stands between me and my blessing is faith. You have God in the measure in which you desire him. So if it is that you desire God, 10%. You're not putting up much effort, 10%. That's what you're going to get. If you desire him 20%, that's what you're going to get. If you desire him 100%, that's what you're going to get. So you have God in the measure in which you desire him. So we need to do what as of tonight. Start thinking big. So when you ask the Lord for a house, you don't ask for one, one room and one bathroom. Say, Lord, I'm going to start from here. So no, man. Ask for the two-story and the three-story. Not you. Think big. And God will operate in your life. We'll see further in the lesson that she went and she borrowed a lot of vessels. But guess what? She could only fill the vessels that she had borrowed. Only what she had borrowed, she was able to fill. And if she had more than what they took to her, the oil would still be flowing. So to us, we need to desire God in the plentitude of his might. And he will bless us in the plentitude of his might. The desire that brings God must be more than a feeble, short-lived wish. Because wishing is one thing, but willing is different. The scripture says, as the heart panteth after the water brooks, so panteth my soul after thee, dear God. Now I look up wishing, and I looked up willing. Wishing means to have a desire, but it may or may not happen. All right? Whereas if you, when you're willing, it is eager to do something or to get something. So let's go again. To wish for something, it's, I would say, to merely have a desire for something. It may happen or it may not happen. For example, I'm wishing to be a doctor. But am I willing to study seven years to achieve it? I want to be successful in life. But am I willing to work hard enough to reap the success? I want to travel the world. I want to go to Brazil. I want to go to Spain. But are we willing to pay the fear to go? So, the desire to bring God must be more than just a feeble wishing. All right? It must be a desire. We must be willing to go the mile. We must be willing to suffer the cost. All right? Lazy wishing and actively desiring are two entirely different postures of mind. The former, which is lazy wishing, gets nothing. And the latter, which is willing, gets everything. All right? So lazy, lazily, lazy wishing gets you nowhere. Being a lukewarm believer gets you nowhere. So it's either you're in or you're out. Either your desire for God is there or it's not there. It can't be midway or in between. It has to be here or there. Either you're going to believe God or you're not going to believe him. All right? Actively desiring not only gets God, but with God all that God can bring. <laughs> and I like, when, I, when, I, when I saw that, when I put that down, I liked it. Actively desiring God, not only gets God, but it gets God and all of who he is. That's when you would desire him. All right? And so this poor widow had nothing in her house but a pot of oil. She was not as well off as the widow of Zarephath to whom Elijah went. She had a cruise of oil and a little meal in the barrel. She had a little more than what this lady have. All this lady have is just a, a, crew, a, a little jar of oil. All right? And so, yet in this extremity, with this jar of oil as her sole possession, what does the prophet tell her to do? 
go and borrow empty vessels of all her neighbors and to borrow just as many as she could get. And what a strange demand. Get empty vessels. Empty. Why not borrow the vessel with something in them? If she had borrowed vessels with items in them, or what she desire in them, she put herself in more debt, don't it? Because <laughs> she's already indebted, and if she's borrowing it from you with something in there, she's going to have to return it with something more in there. And she have nothing. And remember now, she, her sons are at stake. Matter of fact, her very life. Can you imagine losing two sons? You don't know if they're going to come back. They might not even endure slavery. What he's going to put them through, she doesn't know. Because if he can be so heartless to ask for both of them, you don't know what he'll do with them. So in this distress, this prophet now is telling me to go and borrow a vessel. I'm expecting the prophet to just maybe pray and call down some, something and get me enough money to go and pay off the debt. But this man is telling me, you know, I should go and borrow some empty vessels. And it tells me that God values you most when you are empty. God values empty. If I take this bottle out up here just to show, you know, put them here for a special reason. If I give you this bottle, can we see where the water is? Right. How much more can I pour into this bottle? Not much, don't it? So you see why she couldn't ask for the vessels with things in there? How much can I pour into this bottle? It's empty. As much as it can hold. So you see, when we come before God, and we come full up of everything else, how is he going to fill us? When you come into his house, what did he say to come into his house with? And with praise. So if you come up full, up full with anything else, he's going to fill you. He will fill you, you know, because he's going to give you the desires of your heart. But he can only work with what he had, what you have given him. That's the God of principle. We know he can empty the bottle and put fill it. But he will not do that because he's a God of principle. We have to come to him as we are. So, if you come to him with the bottle half full, he can only fill you to the capacity that you took to him. If you come to him quarter, he can only fill you to the capacity that you took to him. But if you come to him empty, <laughs> you're going to go back full. And the song came to me, empty me of self, O Lord. Empty me of my infirmity. Burn out sin and carnal weakness. Empty me, O God. And it goes on, another song says, burn out. O fire of God, burn out. Till all dross is burnt away. Because if they are left there, he cannot fill you. To the capacity that you can operate. So God is attracted to empty. I know when we go to school, we normally hear that empty barrel make the most noise. <laughs> Not true. So we are afraid of being empty. But when it comes to God, you don't have to worry. Come as empty as you can. Empty as you can. When the Holy of Holies was being built, it was empty. The Lord tell Moses to make it empty because he's going to fill it with his glory. The question to us tonight is, not if you're full enough, but are you empty enough? So it's not if you're full enough. Is are we, sorry, I made a mistake. Not are you empty enough. But are we empty enough? The scripture says, He that hunger and thirst after righteousness shall be filled. What God wants 
to come into his presence are not people who have already figured it out. Not people who have it all together. But he wants people to come into his presence, people who are empty. If you're empty enough, God will fill you. He that hunger and thirst after righteousness shall be filled. God will not fill you if you are already filled. And there's nothing that he can do. Remember, you know, it's our desire. He's a God of principle. It's our desire. What it is that we want? What are we bringing to him? God says, I will not feed you until you are hungry. I will not feed you until you are thirsty. So if you come and already pull up uh, everything and you drink up and you have nothing to get. If I here I'm going to, I went to an all-inclusive hotel on the weekend. I mean, make sure I say when I leave my house, I just eat enough to just sustain me from here to St. James. Because if I'm going to an all-inclusive hotel, I want to go empty because I can't eat anything I want to the capacity that I want. So it's the same principle when you come into the house of the Lord, when you come into the presence of the Lord. So don't be fooled now. I know most times that's what we say when you come into the house of the Lord, not only in his house. His presence, he's everywhere. So if you're at home and we invite his presence and we're going into his presence, he can fill you just there. He has everything that we want. Just like you go to the all-inclusive and you see things that you don't even know which one to choose. And you take up your plate and you walk down the aisle and you take anything that you want. It's the same thing he's saying to us. But what you took up, what did you take up again? An empty plate. And you fill it with all that you want. It's the same thing he's saying to us. Come to me empty. I have a bounty full of blessing. Abundance to give you. But you have to come empty. Prepare to receive your blessings. And so the sons went out. Elisha instructed the mother to get vessels. She don't know what he was going to do with the vessel, but she said, go and get the vessel. And she instructed the sons. And they were, they seemed to be very goodly sons, you know. So they went out and they didn't question. The scripture didn't tell us that they, that they questioned their mommy. And so why are you borrowing empty vessels from mama? What you want to embarrass me? We're already in debt. And you're sending me to somebody's house to borrow an empty vessel. To do what? But they went. And they probably, in my own words, say, Neighbor, <laughs> my mother sent me over here to borrow your empty. And they went house to house, gathering vessels, empty vessels. And they came home to their mother and faith with the empties because they were getting ready for their blessing. So they go from host to host and they ask for empty. Turn to your neighbor and tell your neighbor, give me your empty. <laughs> Can I borrow your empty? If you don't need it, I have use for it because I'm expecting a blessing because my God specializes in empty. So the fact that they were bringing empty vessels into their house implied that she had something to fill it with. And this shows the greatness of the woman's faith because she knew she only had a cruise of oil. But she went to the source that she knows through the servant of, of, of God to get what it is that she wants to get her out of the debt. And this man of God tell her, go and borrow some vessels, some empty vessels. So the fact that I'm getting empty vessels is, must be that we have something to put in it. I don't know what it is, but the man of God say I should do it. Say God say, I mean, man of God, I am thinking... And my belief, he is operating under the unction of the Holy Ghost, of, the, of God. 
So if he says it, it is God who is telling me. So if it is that he says bring empty vessels, it means he has what to put in the empty vessels. I'm not going to question what it is that he's going to put in there. He knows and I'm trusting that whatever he puts in there will take me out of what I am in. So if God tells you to do something, go down the road, go down to Santa Cruz on Saturday morning at 10 o'clock, stand at the stoplight. I don't know why I'm going down there. But God said, go stand up down there. You go down there. It might seem foolish and stupid. You might look like a mad woman or a madman. But go down to the stoplight at the time that the Lord tells you to go. And do as he say. He will do what he will through you and in you. And I look at a few things that shows the greatness of this woman's faith. Number one. She trusted God's prophet. Secondly, she knew that he would not deceive her or ask her to do anything for which there is not a good reason. Thirdly, she trusted God's power. And last but not least, she knew that God was able in his own way and in his own time to supply all her need. And I like that part. In his own way, in his own time. Because he didn't put a time on it either, you know. He just said, go and get the vessel. He didn't say, two years from now or two days from now, you'll see what will happen. He just said, go and get it. So God will work in his own time, in his own way. All we need to do is to ask. We don't know how he's going to do it. We don't know when he's going to do it. And that is the reason that sometimes we walk away from our blessing because we are tired of waiting. He will not put a time limit on it. Because a thousand years in our sight is but a day in God's sight. So all we have to do is just to believe and to obey. So we need to learn a similar faith. We need to trust God that He can, He will. And he does supply the daily wants of his people. And that's why in the model prayer, he tells us, he asks us, in the model prayer, we are to ask for our daily bread. What it is to take me through today, not tomorrow, not next week. And sometimes we worry too much. We worry about what will happen next year sometimes, sometimes three years down the line. And we have high blood pressure. And for God's sake, he said, our daily bread. So we get up this morning and we say, Lord, what it is that, no, give me my, my bread for today. What should take me to the end of the day? And that is it. No more. Tomorrow morning again, you get up. So God is not, I guess in our own, in our humanity, we are judging based on how our relatives treat us. How our parents treat us, how our brethren treat us, how our friends treat us. So I can't go to Sister Marian today and say, Boy, yes, make me run out of gas, asking if you could help me to buy it. And next week, we come back again, or tomorrow, we come back and say, You know, say, um, the salt run out. Sister Marian, I'll get tired of you, not you. And she starts, say, Boy, I mean, no, you know, we don't have it. So we know are thinking that our God is like that. No. We can go to him every day. He, a matter of fact, he invites us to come to his throne boldly. He said, come boldly to my throne. So he's expecting us. He placed it there in the model prayer for us to ask for our daily bread. So he's expecting us to come daily for our bread. But we fail many times to ask him. We get up and we go about our day as if it's the norm. It's okay for me to get up in the morning, to wake up. We feel it's, norm, it's normal to get up and walk about, don't it? It seems like it's the natural thing to do, but it's really not. We should give him thanks every morning that we get up. We open our eyes. We can walk around. It's a blessing. It doesn't, it's not just okay. It's the normal thing to do. So we need to think about it. His mercies. His peace, his love is renewed every day.
every morning is a new mercy. Every morning is a new love, a new forgiveness. Every day. Though the purse is empty, God can send the means to fill it. And when I looked at this passage of scripture, if you, if you, if you go back to the, the scripture before, the, verse, the, the, the chapter before, verse 3, you will see the miracle of the principle of the digging of the ditches. And this tells me the amount of the amount of man's work with the miracle, with the miracle determine the amount of blessing and provision actually received. Let me go again. The amount of man's work with the miracle determine the amount of blessing and provision you actually receive. God's powerful provision invites our hard work and never excuses laziness. And I will summarize the story that happens in chapter 3. It was a time when Elisha was going off the scene. He fell sick. You can read the story in its entirety after. And the Moabites came up against the, the, the king of Israel. And he was, in, in my own words, he was wondering, this prophet is going off the scene. What is going to happen to us as, as, as a nation? Will we win our battles? Will we be defeated? What is going to happen? Who would we turn to? Because if, if you read through the book of um, second, First and Second Kings, whenever they are to go up in battle against any other nations, they generally seek the, seek the Lord. And in seeking the Lord, they will go through the prophets. So this prophet is going off the scene. So he was probably wondering what is going to happen. And Elisha, even though in his sick state, he says to him, he is to shoot some arrows. And then he said to him, no, not that one. No, not that one. Sorry. That's a later one down, which I want to speak to us about as well. He said to him that, he is to gather, he, I think the, the, the king went and got two other kings with him to go into battle. And he told him that they should dig some wells. The Lord said they should dig some wells. And there, no wind will come, no rain will come, but he's going to fill it with water. So that their cattle can get water to drink and they also can be fed from the water. When they dug the wells, I note... Um, carefully that he did not tell him how much wells to dig. That, was, that stood out to me. He did not say how many, how many wells there are to dig. He just said there are to dig some wells and he's going to fill it with water for them and the cattle. No, if I was that king, I would be wondering how does digging a well, the Lord filling it with water to feed us and our cattle, how does that allow us to win the battle? How does that, I don't, I just, it doesn't add up. But they obeyed what the prophet said. They went and they dug. And when the nations came up, came up against them, when they were approaching them and they looked, the waters that they saw didn't look like water that was in the well. The well was indeed filled with water, but they saw red blood, like blood. The water looked red like blood. And they were saying that, oh, they have slain them and they, are, they, are, they, are, they have all been killed. So we are going in now to get the spoils. And when they went to get the spoils, they overthrew them and they won the battle. So, so the number of ditches that they built, that they dug, they had to do something in order for God to work the miracle. So they had something to do. They were instructed to go and dig the wells. He'll fill it with water. And this is what he did. He deceived the enemy. So the principle to us is that we have something to do in order to get our miracle. It's not just handed down to us, a drop in the lap. And if we know how we are as humans, anything we get free, what we do with it? Easy come easy go. We would not value it. Alright? And so, I believe God teaching us an object lesson too. 
we value what we put our work in. I know many of us, and, I, and this might be a sore point for some of us. Some of us probably didn't leave when we had challenges here because we're saying what? My money bill you did pay here, not you. The hard work I did here, I can't leave it. I have to be here to enjoy it, don't you? So, it is for us that when we are told by the man of God that we should do something in order to wrought the miracle and the blessing in our lives, we should not be afraid to do it. No matter how foolish it seems, no matter how stupid we might look, we are instructed to do it, and God will work on our behalf. Ver if we look closely at verses 4 and 6, it says, And when the, the word come in, and this is Elijah speaking to the, to the, still speaking to the widow, Thou shalt shut the door upon thee, and upon thy sons, and thou shalt pour out into all those vessels, and thou shalt set aside that which is full. So she went from him and shut the door upon her sons, who brought the vessels to her, and she poured out. And it came to pass, when the vessels were full, that she said unto her son, Bring me yet a vessel. And he said unto her, There is not a vessel more. And the oil stayed. So if we put this into perspective, the miraculous provision was a spiritual experience not designed for public show. Because he asked her that when they come with the vessels, you're not going to stay in your yard and just pour so everybody see what's happening. He said, go inside. That even, he didn't even say he's coming inside with her. If you note, he said, go inside you and your sons, shut the door, and then begin to pour. So sometimes God is working in our lives. We don't need to share it with everybody. We don't need to share it with anybody. God will reveal it in time. Because some people are dream killers. You'll tell people that the Lord said, I should buy a key ring. I don't know what he's going to give me. I don't know if it's a house or it's a car. Yeah, idiot. We are buy, buy car ring. We are buy ring for people who are going to do that. You are idiot. Nobody, nobody none. The Lord not speaking to that person. Because there is no way your God is going to embarrass you. The Lord said, I should go down to Santa Cruz. I should stand by the stoplight and I should wait. You are idiot. You are thinking you are mad, smuddy. At 10 o'clock in the night, where are you going? I kill that the prophet want you, want you to be dead. Kill him, want to kill you. So some things you have to do on your own, in private. Sometimes if you are married, not even your husband, not even your wife, not even your children, he says, shut in. Not everything, the Lord will reveal it in time. Sometimes, somehow we talk too much. And that's why we lose the blessing. How we tell the wrong person. As I often said, I said to my Sunday school, when you are, when you have taken on the name of the Lord Jesus in baptism, what a baptism? The same way an angel is set to encamp around you and to stay with you. Is the same way the devil sent one of his angel to encamp around you to stand beside you. So you see, when you, when you hear your miracle, you see, when you pray your prayer, the two angels are listening. And guess what? He's going to replicate anything that God does. He's going to replicate it. So you ask for a, 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 a bottle, a green bottle with a white top and yellow around it, yellow strip around it. And you get your green bottle. And you say it out, and you pray out, you know. And you get your green bottle with your yellow strip around it, and your white, and you say, yes, man, and you run off with, it, with your bottle. Not knowing that that's not the bottle that the Lord sent. It wasn't the Lord who sent that bottle. And many times, I made that mistake many times too. What we need to do, we need to go back in prayer. And ask God, did you send me the green bottle with the white top and the yellow around it? And he will, and I, I guarantee you, you will get the answer. So not everything 
that the Lord tells you, sometimes Bishop, and you will see Bishop demonstrated, both from Bishop Evans' days to these days, I've seen it. There are times he will be praying for you, and he will voice it from the mic. He'll say, sis, God is going to do this, he's going to do that. And there are times, the mic is down, and he whispers in your ears, it wasn't for the public. But guess what? We run off how we're so happy. Sometimes we're so happy, we go tell, and we go tell, it wasn't intended for anyone else, but for you. That's why the Lord allowed him to put away the mic and tell you directly. That miracle, that blessing is for you. You are to shut in with that miracle, with that blessing, whatever you are told between you and God. He will reveal it in time. Yes, we know as humans, sometimes we are, we are so exuberant. We are happy. We, want, we are excited. I want to get it out. But we need to do what? Go to him in prayer. He will allow us to temper that excitement. So we need to know when to be vocal and when to be silent. Notice also that God used what she already had to bless her. It's like the five loaves and the two fishes. They already had it. In their possession, the Lord just bless it and multiply it. All right? In verse 6, she said to her son, bring me yet a vessel. And it could be that, remember she had two sons, so it could be that while she's pouring, one son will remove that vessel to put aside, and the other would bring the new vessel. So I think this is a principle that verse 6 is telling us. And so the woman was well rewarded for her unquestioning faith. So as long as she continued pouring from her little jar, so long the oil continued to flow, until all the vessels were full. She could have filled more vessels if she had them. So if you notice, as long as there was an empty vessel, the oil was still running. As long as there was an empty vessel, the oil was still running. So it is up to us. I spoke about the well. They could have dug one. I'm not sure if one well could really do the work that several wells did to show the amount of redness or the blood that they think would have come from the, 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 the camp of the Israelites. If her sons were rebellious and did not go to all the neighbors and gather all that they could, they, only would, they would only have as much as they would have taken. So if they took five, they could only fill five vessels. If you take 10, it fill 10. 15, 20. So it's up to us to ask ourselves the question tonight, what it is that I'm bringing to the Lord? How many vessels am I willing to bring before him for him to fill? But just to remember that as long as there's an empty vessel, oil will be supplied. And so at any rate, she had enough to sell for the repayment of her debt and to provide for herself and her sons with a temporary support. Our blessings may be limited by our capacity to receive. Go again. Our blessings may be limited by our capacity to receive. I spoke about the bottle being half empty, being half full. What it is that would limit our blessing? What would block us or block our blessing or block us from receiving in abundance from God? What? Disobedience? Rebellion? Be rebellious, lack of faith, anymore, laziness, that's right. So you have, covered, you have covered a lot. 
And I, and I also had in, on, on my jottings the busyness of life. So we don't have time to receive the blessing. We don't have time for God. We don't have time to receive the blessing, to do what it is to get the blessing that we want. All right? And so we are the ones who block our blessings many times. We limit our blessings. So we don't gather enough vessels. We don't dig enough wells. All right? But there's no limit to God's love. There's no limit to his blessings. There's no limit to his power to bless. So we don't have to be sorry for God and say, Lord, I'm not thinking he can do this. I don't think he can give me that. Sometimes we want a lot of money, you know. But we fail to ask for, we want five million, and we just ask for our million. Because we don't think that God will provide five million. Five million? Maybe he'll give me a million and i work for the rest. When he's saying to us, anything that you ask, I will give it to you. But we limit him because of our limited minds. We limit him and then lose what on our blessing. So we are the ones who are standing in the path of our blessing. And another one that comes to me just as I speak, it's giving. Giving and only giving because you expect to receive. This is Marian speaking. This is not written in stone or law or in the Bible. But I believe... I believe we are not blessed if we give only to receive. So we hear Minister Richards get up and say, boy, I give $2,000 last week, you know, and I got $50,000. And in my mind, I need $100,000. So guess what? If Sister Cav give 2000 and get fifty, I'm going to give, no matter where I get the 4000 from, I'm going to give 4000 because I want 100000 I don't believe you're blessed. You don't? The motive, that's it. The motive behind giving is only to receive. I don't believe that you are blessed. We should not limit God's power to bless. He will bless us in abundance. He gives in overflowing measure. Far beyond our expectation, far beyond what we deserve. So we should not limit them. But then we may limit the blessing for ourselves by not being in a fit state to receive it. We see constantly in scripture and in the history of the Christian church that there are certain conditions under which larger spiritual blessings may be expected and certain conditions which may hinder these blessings. And I speak to three of them. The first one I had, we may hinder our blessing by want of faith and expectation. So we can limit our blessing by want of faith or lack of faith and expectation. I deal with the, the example of the faith. Had Abraham... Per persevered in prayer. He might have won the salvation of Sodom, even on account of the righteousness of Lot alone, if he had persevered, persevered a little longer. Sometimes we want something from God. It's just around the corner, but we give up just before he gives it to us. Persevere. Sometimes he knows, as I said before, you know, what we want. He knows just what we need. He knows what it is that will empower us. But sometimes he's saying, I'm giving it to you, but I need you to persevere. I need you to work for it. All right? I need to put some effort, some desire. As I said before, if you get it easy, we will not value it. It will not be valued. All right? And when we speak of expectation, Elisha was approached by King Joash. Joash. And this was the one I was referring to earlier when he came to Elisha 
and was asking, he wanted to know if it is that after he died, they would still survive. They would be still, they'll still be able to win battles, even though he'll not, he'll not, he's not on the scene. And this was when he told him to shoot the arrows. And he did shoot the arrows. And he told him to smite the ground. And King Josh smite the ground three times. And Elisha was upset with him because he said to him, the number of times that you smite the ground, that's the number of battles that you're going to win. If you had done it five or six times, you would have won the battles six times. But only three times he limited himself, even though the prophet told him to go ahead and smite the ground. He limited himself and only did it three times. And he only won the battle thrice. After that, he lost the battles. So when the Lord instructs that we do something, we should do it in his fullness. Do it not limiting God. He placed a limit on God for only three battles. And that's all he got. You noticed? The, 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 the woman with the vessels went and borrowed as much as she could have borrowed. And I believe, this is my belief, there wasn't any, any more for her to borrow. And she had all of them filled. Unlike the, 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 the king who only limited God to three and it's the same thing I said to us earlier. We want $5 million, but we limit God to a $1 million. You think he's going to give us the $5 million? He's going to give us to the capacity that we are expecting or that we are limiting him to. Just to do what? It's to teach us an object lesson too. Whatever we want from God, and I bet you, I can bet you, if you ask for a million and he give you, for $5 million and he give you a million, you are going to use it as an object lesson and say, why if God give me a million, you can't give me five. So the next time you ask for the five and you get it. But what happened to you is that you lose out. How what you could have done when you have gotten the, um, the million dollars, you'd have already covered it with the five million dollars. But you were delayed and it delayed your process. So we should not limit God because in limiting God, you're also limiting yourself. The next point I wanted to make on this is we may also hinder our blessings by not making a right use of those we have got. The Bible tells us to him that hath, that hath shall be given and from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he seemeth to have. There is no waste in God's kingdom. He will not give further blessings to those who are neglecting or misusing the privileges that they have got. Let us see to it that we are in a fit state to receive God's blessings. If we regard iniquity in our hearts, the Lord will not hear us. So let us do what? Empty ourselves of worldliness and selfishness and sin if we are to expect God to fill us with his spirit. A word to us, brethren, tonight is to do search our heart. Examine our own lives. See if there is anything that is hindering our divine blessing. Give up that besetting sin and receive your blessing. Give up that godless society and receive your blessing. There is no waste in the kingdom of God. If he blesses you and you waste, he'll move on to someone else. He's not going to wait on you if you disregard what he has blessed you with. Many of us are blessed with gifts and we have talents and we neglect them thinking God is going to wait on you so that if he waits on you the church is going to wait on you don't it and he's not going to do that he will take it away from you as I'm encouraging us tonight to search our heart 
See if it is that we are blocking our divine blessing. Put away the pride. Put away hatred. Malice. Love for the world. Put away evil temper out of your heart. Then and only then can you expect God's blessing to flow. Then and only then, God will make you a blessing. Then and only then, you will be vessel meat for the master's use. And so in verse 7, she came to the man of God and she told him, Well, she came to the man of God and he told her, go sell the oil and pay thy debt and live thou and thy children of the rest. And when I look at this verse as well, it says something to me. Most persons probably would have looked at this, maybe the widow, probably would say, I'm in distress. I am heartbroken. I am weighed down. So I'm expecting then that the Lord will provide a blessing. Yes, I'm going to him for help. He's going to send the blessing, but he's going to send the money. I'm not expecting to go and sell no oil to get the money. That's work. But she did not question God. She went, she got her vessels, she poured the oil, and the man of God instructed that they go and they sell it. This is the way that the Lord chooses to bless. This is the way he chooses to take her out of the debt. Not the way she expected or us who are reading the, the passage would have expected it to turn out. We are expecting the man of God to lay hands on her man and call down the blessing man. And maybe the man, not even that, many of us would think that the Lord would allow the man's heart to be softened. And he said, okay, I forgive the debt. It's not the 15th year yet, but I forgive the debt. But no, the Lord says, you're going to borrow the vessel, you're going to pour the oil, and you're going to sell the oil to get the money. We don't know how God is going to work. What he's saying to us, be prepared to receive the blessing. How are you to be prepared to, to receive the blessing? Empty of yourself. We know me, I know me more than anybody else. I'm only looking at Sister Cav. I'm only looking at uh, um, Elder from the outside. We know what it is that is inside of us that's blocking our blessing. We know what we are full of that God cannot fill us. If we were empty, as he's asking us to be, in his presence, when we come here on a Sunday morning or whenever we come to church, the moderator don't have to be pumping us because we're heavy, you know, because we're already full up of everything else, you know, where we can't get up and we can't worship freely. But if we come emptying of ourselves to be filled up him, what we'll be doing is just receiving what it is that he has to pour into us. But we are expecting it another way. He should probably use the bishop to pray for you and the things go. But we know we have the work to be done. We have to release these things from our minds. The malice, the hate, the backbiting, the unforgiveness. All of these, we need to get rid of them. And then he can fill us. He can bless us. He can use us. All right, we have potential, you know. We have potential in God. But we are not operating at our full capacity because we are blocking. Something is blocking. She prepared to receive her blessing through faith and obedience to the word of God. And so the word of the Lord to us tonight is to prepare for our blessing. And one of the many ways to prepare for it is to be empty. So in closing, I encourage us to ask God 
to turn on the searchlight on us and in us. Give us the heart to repent so that we can be empty and ready for the master's use. Turn on the searchlight in us. Give us the heart to repent so that we can be empty and we can be ready for the master's use. He can't use us in the way that we are now. In the state we are now, he cannot use us. And that's why when the Lord uses a person that we think we know something about, it is that the Lord has cleaned that person because he will not use a dirty vessel. It is that the Lord has cleaned that person and is using him or her. So if we find that we are not of use in the house of the Lord, we are not being used by the master, it is because we are not empty. We are not empty. And he wants to use us. He made us so that he can live out his righteousness in us. We are his agents on earth. So he needs us. He wants to use us. I know he can do without us. He can use the benches. He can use the podium. But who would want the podium to preach to them tonight? Who would want the rustum to come out and pray for you? So he's using you and I. But if it is and we know how we operated in the past, what it is that we were used to do, what we were how, how, we, how he used to operate in us. And if he's not doing that, it means that we are not ready. We are not empty. And so, again, in closing, I encourage us to allow that searchlight to be turned on in us, turned on on us, and I implore us to repent so that we can be empty and be fit and ready for the master's use. God bless you.